Brace yourself. Before we get started, let's step outside the Pantheon for a second. I have a lot of respect for video game musicians, the men and women who have crafted iconic game soundtracks, but I think there are many others who simply don't get the praise they deserve. For every Oimatsu and Kondo, there are hundreds of other composers who I don't think get their fair share of praise. Video game music has undergone so many changes that it's difficult to know where to start, and we're bound to find some unsung heroes crafting their own scores. Today, I want to give props to one of those unlikely candidates, a group that I feel really gets overlooked when it comes to musical history and games. The irony of all this is that the community is pretty aware and appreciative of this act. The group has left their mark, but in a more surface level appreciation. And I think they deserve more than that. Let's talk June Sonoe and Johnny Gioelli and their band Crush 40. With the 16-bit console wars of the mid-90s winding down, Jun Sonoe had already established himself as a strong composer in Sega's arsenal, working on several pieces for Sonic the Hedgehog 3 and Sonic 3D Blast. But once Sega named him as the lead composer and sound director for the Dreamcast title, Sonic Adventure, all eyes were on him. No pressure, really. Sonoe knew how to craft a classic Sonic track. It would have been a slam dunk to use many of the same stylistic directions that made Sonic so popular in the early and mid-90s. Call it nostalgia blindness if you feel, but I have a lot of trouble criticizing those older songs. They're fantastic recordings that have made their mark in gaming history. Those tracks melded with the stage's atmosphere so deliberately, and even the games that might have missed the mark on a gameplay level still had quality OSTs. It all holds up extremely well. But Sonic's journey into the third dimension came with expectations. This was going to be the defining step for Sonic as a character and a series, one that was to show everyone that he's willing to go toe-to-toe -to -toe not just with his rival Mario, but the entire slew of mascot platform heroes that appeared since his 16-bit heyday. There was a lot riding on Sonic Adventure, but as those early trailers played, it was clear that things weren't going to be the same. But it wasn't just the setting, the tech, the gameplay. What played over all of these acrobatics and set pieces was a brand new kind of soundtrack. This mix of hard rock and heavy metal was built to complement Sonic's new design and gameplay, and it stuck. This all sounded so modern, it was Sega firing on all cylinders, kicking things into overdrive, and giving Sonic a brand new stylistic palette to work with. The revving guitar riffs and those wailing vocals from Gioelli gave Sonic Adventure an extra jolt of aggression and intensity. Sure, the lyrics were a bit cheesy, but they channeled the energy of 80s rock bands like Guns N' Roses and even Bon Jovi. No other Sonic game had songs like these. That theme, Open Your Heart, was such a statement. All of it confidently demonstrated that Sega was ready to evolve what a Sonic game could and would be, and that Jun Sonoe had every intention to deliver a soundtrack that was just as evolutionary. Past Sonic games had soundtracks that, while definitely more aggressive than their rivals, never leaned into the kind of territory of Sonic Adventure's more epic moments. The main themes especially had a sense of playfulness to them, which fits Sonic's classic character profile well. Sonic had his moments of seriousness, but it was always about him teasing his opponents before blasting past them in a blur. Sonic always was a speedster hero who was also a bit of a troll. The music followed this, even in its most serious moments. Sonic's soundtracks were whimsical and carnivalesque, and I'm not just talking about the casino levels. The bouncing beats of Green Hill Zone, the slick electronics of Chemical Plant, the chilled atmosphere of Ice Cap, it was all fantastic, some of the most memorable in Sonic history. And to be fair, when you consider the entirety of the soundtrack, Sonic Adventure didn't abandon that mentality. Listening to the level themes, there's still a lot of old traditions lingering in that OST. Emerald Coast and Windy Valley still are pretty catchy, expanding original composition directions with enhanced production and more varied instruments. Individual character themes are diverse in genres, giving an identifiable vibe to each member of the cast. Old tracks from classic games even got newly recorded versions for Sonic Adventure, Really, Sonoe and his team were daring to mix things up with Sonic Adventure's soundtrack. But Open Your Heart had something else. It had stakes. As far as Sega was concerned, this was going to be Sonic's finest hour, because all things considered, they needed it to be. The Dreamcast had an uphill battle, so Sonic Adventure needed to stand and deliver. 
Open Your Heart as a main theme shows the scope of Sega's ambition. It was built to kick things up a notch, even going so far as being the initial theme of the game's true final boss. The production for the theme was clearly taking advantage of the Dreamcast capabilities, even more than the rest of the music. But it was that singular statement that showed to everyone what Sonic's future was going to be moving forward. The cheerful playfulness of Sonic's past was no longer the primary focus, and in its place was a battle cry from Crush 40. Sonoe continued this direction in Sonic Adventure 2, bursting out from the get-go with Live and Learn, which, to this day, has solidified its place in Sonic's history. As the theme of one of the series' darkest and most serious games, it was bound to expand on the heightened stakes of Sonic Adventure's theme, Open Your Heart. Live and Learn is a feature in Sonic Adventure 2, playing in all sorts of places, and like Open Your Heart, it plays during the true final boss fight. From its soaring chorus, intense guitar solo, and climax at Hold On To What If, it's downright anthemic, as another major statement from Sonoe for what it meant to be a Sonic song. It just roared. From that point forward, Crush 40 was inseparable from the Sonic series. With each new game came another opportunity to blast down the doors with another anthem. With Sonic Heroes and Shadow the Hedgehog, Crush 40 continued to experiment, going for more upbeat pop rock themes in the former and darker industrial influences in the latter. With each new Sonic game, Sonoe and Crush 40 weren't far behind, and despite the game's steady critical decline, the soundtracks always managed to shine through with Crush 40's contributions standing out amongst the track lists. But with Sonic the Hedgehog for the 360 and PS3, Sonoe's contributions were far more subdued, especially with the soundtrack being handled primarily by Tomoya Otani. Older tracks did make their appearance, but Sonoe's hard rock style of music didn't appear to fit in with the even grander cinematic ambitions that Sonic the Hedgehog 2006 was aiming for. With fewer and fewer appearances, Crush 40 was starting to lose their inheritance to the Sonic the Hedgehog series. Sonoe's compositional contributions to the series began to be reserved to spin-offs, and much of Crush 40's presence was sectioned to live performances at Sonic events, like the Sonic Boom 2013 show in St. Louis, and the disaster that was Sonic's 25th anniversary celebration. It was beginning to become clear that Crush 40 had an era of prominence with the Sonic series, and like any era, it was bound to come to an end eventually. But I think we often forget just how big of a deal Crush 40 were during Sonic's 3D times. Even though Sonoe and Gioelli were producing music long before Sonic Adventure, it was that opportunity to helm original music for the game that their potential was apparent to the masses. Crush 40 evolved the musical identity of Sonic the Hedgehog games, no question. But doing that was risky. Crush 40's adrenaline-drenched hard rock and heavy metal direction was not something you'd associate with Sonic if you saw him back in the early 90s. Yeah, there was an edge to his personality, but like I said, it was playful. During the gap between Sonic's heyday on the Genesis and his bold revitalization on the Dreamcast, games were shedding away that playful nature and trying to make something more serious. It was clear as day with systems like the PlayStation making waves. Sega and Sonic evolved to keep pace with a constantly changing market. There was a push to take that risk, and no guarantee that it would go over well with the longtime fans of Sonic. When we look back and see just how big of a gamble that was, it makes Crush 40's lasting legacy all the more impressive. There are large groups of people who, if you asked what musical track they'd immediately think of when Sonic the Hedgehog is brought up, it wouldn't be Green Hill Zone's theme from Sonic 1. Not Chemical Plant Zone from Sonic 2. Not Ice Cap Zone from 3. None of those classic era tracks. Instead, they'd think of Live and Learn from Sonic Adventure 2. They'd think of a song that strays so far from Sonic's musical roots, if you played the two consecutively to someone with no knowledge of Sonic the Hedgehog, they probably wouldn't even know that the songs are from the same series. They're that different. Praise Mario's music as much as you want, it does deserve that praise. But Nintendo stayed a pretty steady course with that series on a musical level. There weren't enormous earth shakers, no dramatic musical shift from 2D to 3D Mario games. Sonic, on the other hand, had that paradigm shift. The music changed so dramatically from 2D to 3D. I mean, think about the trailer that announced Sonic for Super Smash Bros. Brawl. For a character with such an extensive history entering such a high-profile title, and being one of the first third-party characters announced for the series, it would make a lot of sense to add his most recognizable music track for the debut trailer. But what did they play? Live and Learn by Crush 40. That was the song that defined Sonic at that moment in time, a song so different from Sonic's past, but one that was ingrained in his cultural identity. Jun Sonoe pulled off a really tricky move. 
For a series with such a footprint, it would have been pretty safe to stick to the classic era's guns and stick with that kind of musical direction. It would have been alright, I'm sure, but still a safe move. But by taking that risk, Crush 40 didn't just jump the gap, they stuck the landing and got the photo finish to boot. While their grandest moments are still in the past, slightly spiked by nostalgia, the fact that they can still hold that value to the Sonic community is something worth praising. Sonic's gone through so many musical changes over the course of his entire career, from classic 16-bit jingles in the 90s to chiptune throwbacks here in the 2010s. But Jun Sonoe's daring leap into new territory for the series was really the one to remember, even decades later. Crush 40 changed Sonic music, and I think they deserve applause for that.